Church family, welcome to Cornerstone. I'm Raya Joy Laferre, and I'm a member here at Cornerstone. I am excited to worship with you and pursue God's presence together today. Whether you've been coming for a while or today is your very first visit, on campus or online, we are so glad that you're joining us. If you're a visitor, we would love to connect with you, help you find community. For all our in-person guests, we have connect cards in the seat back in front of you. You can fill out the card and bring it to the info center in the lobby for a welcome gift after this service. Our info center volunteers are available to help anyone with questions or ways to connect with our community. And if you're a guest watching online, visit the helpful connection links below this video. We'd love to hear from you. At Cornerstone, we believe in the importance and the power of prayer. Whether it be a request or a praise report, we want to come alongside you in speaking directly with God. If you want to pray with the whole church family, we have whiteboards in the hallway where you can write out your prayers. If you need someone to pray over you today, there's a dedicated prayer room with volunteers available to hear your story. And even if you're online, we have a pastor waiting to pray with you in real time. Or you can reach out on our website link below no matter how you share your need, your prayer requests will be specifically prayed for and handled confidentially. We believe that another way we worship God is by giving back a portion of what he has so generously given to us. Your financial support allows our church to better serve God and to serve others both here in our local community and throughout the whole world. If you're new or visiting, your gift to us is you being here today. But if you call Cornerstone your church home and have come prepared to give, we have several opportunities for you to give as shown on the screen. We really can't thank you enough for your faithful giving. As you can see, God is doing awesome things here at Cornerstone. We'd love for you to jump in and be a part of it. Worship is going to begin soon, so take a few seconds to focus your attention on the Lord. Thanks again for being with us today. Good morning, Cornerstone. Excited that you are here to worship this morning. If you're watching online, up in the loft, does not matter. Excited that you guys are here with us. Um, hopefully you're gonna have a good day, because. Happy International Moment of Laughter Day. I felt like, I don't know. I got up this morning and I was like, I was just curious, like what's the national holiday today? So it's not a good joke, but thanks for laughing in, in light of the holiday. Uh, but if you're new with us, Pastor Don, that one got you. That one got you, I saw it. If you're new, we're excited that you're here. Do me a favor, grab the connect card in the seat back in front of you. Grab that, fill it out. Stop by the, the, uh, the info desk out in the lobby and we would love to meet you, get to know you, and we have a small gift for you as well. You know, as we're kind of hoping and praying that this string of sunny days continues, but I feel like, you know, April, as we're getting into spring, it's just a season of transitions, talking to some of the young adults about graduating college, and we got high schoolers getting ready to graduate, kids getting ready to move up to the next grade, but that season of transitions get really stressful, overwhelming. And one of the most powerful things we have at our disposal is prayer and being able to communicate with our awesome creator, God. So we want to connect with you in any way that we can. We have a team of volunteers in our prayer room right outside our worship center who are waiting to pray with you if you need to sit down and pray with somebody. We have prayer boards out in the hallway where you can leave prayer requests anonymously. And we have a drop box right next to those prayer boards where you can put in a card and a pastor will reach out and connect with you. But I hope you're able to grab a bulletin. We got some amazing Amazing things coming up. We got a true, uh, true girl crazy hair tour coming up in just a couple of weeks. But I did want to make you aware of one thing. Uh, save the dates for May 31st, Friday, May 31st. We're having a better love date night. And this is going to be an awesome event. It's for anybody who's been married, whether you've been married for a week or for what feels like a hundred years. If you're engaged, even if you're dating and you're seriously considering marriage. 
And this is Better Love is an assessment that was done by Dr. Les and Leslie Parrott. They wrote Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts in partnership with Dr. Gary Chapman, who wrote The Five Love Languages. And this is gonna be an incredible event. It's gonna be a huge resource for uh, you and your spouse, you and your partner. Uh, but fellas, let me tell you this. There's a staff member and she has been married over 30 years. She didn't give me permission to use her name because she was embarrassed about it. But she said, if my husband invited me to this, I would faint. So fellas, you put it on the calendar. You make the first move. Don't wait for your wife to come and be like, honey, we should go to this. You do it, you, you take the initiative. All right, it's gonna be an incredible resource for you and your fiance, your wife, your husband, you know, whatever, wherever you're at, we, we would love to do that. But guys, I'm excited this morning to spend some time in the word and to worship together. So would you stand and let's give the Lord all the praise and the worship that he deserves. All right, come on, put your hands together with me. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise you in the valley. Praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. around it cause praise is the water my enemies drown in oh as long as I'm breathing I got a reason to praise the Lord of my soul praise the Lord of my soul It's more than a sound My praise is the shout That brings Jericho down And as long as I'm raising up I got a reason to praise the Lord Oh my soul Praise the Lord Oh my soul
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. One more time. Praise the Lord. Let everything, Let everything that has breath. That has breath. Praise, the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Cry. 
join with the angels as they sing holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come god we thank you for your sovereignty your you reign lord god i thank you that you invite us to be holy because you are holy and that doesn't mean that we're better than everyone else that just means that we get to be in an intimate relationship with you lord and in that there is so much life we just thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice and for bringing us to new life, Lord. Hear us as we celebrate that today. No longer I who live, but Christ in me. For I've been born again. My heart is free. The hope of heaven before me. The grace.
Jesus, so fully praise you. He will take all eternity and just like Lazarus. today but saying Lord here we are all of us and from a place of thankfulness all my words fall short I've got nothing new how could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do, and every song must end, Lord, you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, it's all that I
out fear. Hear our hearts, Lord, as we worship you, and thank you that you're here with us. God, and we recognize in light of how good you are, the best we can do. <laughs> it's not even close, and, and yet, Lord, we say, here we are. Here's our offering of praise, our hallelujah, and you love that so much. We just thank you that you're here today. Lord, continue to speak to us. Continue to move in our hearts. Continue to draw us close. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your be, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, and say it with me, church family. Amen. Amen. It's great to, to yeah, come on, let's give the Lord applause. Okay. He's so good. It really is great to worship together, to lift our voices, and, and, and you know, we, we join together. We, we begin to, to sing and express ourselves together in and, and just honor and glory to our King, and, and there's power in that unity. It's such an awesome thing, and so I love it when we worship as a church family. Um, we're so glad you're here. My name is Trent. If we haven't met, I'm the worship pastor here at Cornerstone. It's just uh, awesome to be able to worship together today. And so um, why don't you take a little bit and say hi to a few people around you. And then uh, if it's somebody you don't know, introduce yourself, then you can go ahead and have a seat. Courage. It emerges when we let our faith conquer our fear. It drives us to push beyond uncertainty, risk, and opposition, and do the next right thing. Sometimes, courage can look like charging headlong into potential danger, while other times it can simply be remaining steadfast in justice. God calls us to be strong and courageous. So when you feel hopelessness in the middle of a storm, in the chaos of our culture, know that we serve a God who still cries out to us. Do not be afraid, but take courage. Well, I'll tell you what we're talking about in a minute. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I did in this series is we put a thing in the bulletins asking if people who have been in a situation where it took courage to follow God and to do what he had for you to do, I'd love to hear your story. And we've gotten several of those, and they're wonderful. And none are better than this one. A dear friend of mine who doesn't want us to use his name, uh, but he, is, uh, he was a soldier. And uh, so while this is his story, and it really is his story, it's also the story of all of those brave men and women that protect us and keep us safe every day. And so we want to kind of honor all of our military while we listen to the story of this one great soldier. Listen to this. Dear Pastor Don, I'm so very grateful and thankful you are doing a message on courage. It is so lacking in our society today, especially amongst American men, all because we've lost our faith and trust in God. It does not have to be this way. I do believe that courage comes from an individual's heart. For a Christian, it simply comes from placing your complete faith and trust in Jesus. The greatest piece of advice I've ever been given on courage came from my good friend, Christian brother, and fellow soldier, retired Army Colonel Doug Etter. In 2005, the night before we were to head into Iraq to a small forward operating base outside the city of Fallujah, in the most dangerous and war-torn province in that combat zone called Al-Anbar, 
Then a major, Doug Etter, said the following words to a group of Christian infantry soldiers in our company. You are as safe here in the desert going into battle as you were in your own beds. God did not have to put you here to call you home. You are where he wants and has destined you to be. You fight bravely in the face of our enemies, sacrificing yourself for your brothers if necessary, even if it means your own physical death. It is God's plan and purpose for us to be here at this time and in this place, so have courage. Then we read Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. As you know, some of our brothers did pay the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom and returned home in flag-draped coffins. Throughout that tour, my many other tours in Afghanistan, all the trials and tribulations between me and my former wife, and then after the war, cancer, addiction, financial collapse, and divorce, I still hear and believe those words. Some days it's the only reason I can even get out of bed, but Jesus is my savior. I trust and believe in him and have courage I am not a brave man, but I have seen courage demonstrated many times. I have seen the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to heal all wounds, so I have courage in whatever the future brings. If you would use this story in any way or with anybody, please do not use my name. The only name that should be remembered is Jesus. Isn't that powerful? God bless you. Thank you, friend. Listen, it seems to me that if we're going to talk about courage for five weeks, we should at least take one of those weeks and talk about the alternative. What is the opposite of courage? Well, there's two ways to look at it. If you look at it from like an English major, you would have to say, well, look, here, courage, there's discourage. So it, when you discourage, that's the opposite of courage, right? And that's true in a sense. Um, if, and I think it happens for two reasons. This is just out of personal experience and observation. But it seems to me that when you've been praying for one thing that you really desperately need and you've been praying for it for a long time and God hasn't done it yet. How many of you have ever noticed that God's not nearly as in big a hurry as we are? One time I literally did this. I went and sat down once and decided I'm going to read through all the Gospels and I'm going to see if there's one place in there where Jesus hurried couldn't find it. He was always right on time. Boy, is that convicting. And always did the right thing at just the right time. And because he walked in favor with God and doing the things of God. So I think when you get really weary of well-doing, as it says in Galatians, sometimes it's easy then to be discouraged. And then the other time is just when you're tired when you've ever just been so exhausted and, and exhaustion can very easily open the door for discouragement. Do you know the story of Elijah and the big showdown on Mount Carmel? Uh, you know, Ahab was the king and he was a wicked, terrible king, but he got trumped. He married a woman who was worse than he was, Jezebel. And between them, they just almost ruined the nation of Israel. And Jezebel was, was one of those political marriages where he marries this lady who's the daughter of some Canaanite country. And so it's really, it's not a love thing. It's, it's a thing about that's supposed to bring them advantage. But when she moves in, she brings 450 um, prophets of Baal with her. And uh, so you got Israel divided, the leadership's worshiping Baal, but there's still many followers of the, of the Lord God Almighty. And, and so, one, so Elijah one day, you know, he was, God was so sick of the, of the way that Israel was going that uh, he, he had his prophet, Elijah, walk into the throne room one day, point his finger at the, at the King Ahab and said, you know what? God is so upset with the way you're running this country. It's not going to rain until I say it does. It didn't rain for three years. You know, this is a story that would be better to preach if we were having a drought instead of floods. But you got to work where you are. And uh, so, but that's what was happening there. It's a, Israel is a, is a pretty arid country. And when it, they don't get rain, nothing grows. And so people were really getting hungry and things were bad. And so Elijah comes one day. And he goes back into the, he had to hide for a long time, but he comes back into the king's throne room and he says, we're going to have a showdown. 
You know, okay, Corral style thing. So we're going up to Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is an amazing place because it looks out over the plain of Armageddon. You've heard of that, where the last battle of the world is going to be fought, when Jesus is literally going to come and fight. And so you, you can stand up there on the church that was built, and you can look over this plain and almost imagine what's going to happen there. But Mount Carmel was the place where, where Elijah said, you guys... For 450 of you, you come up with a bull. I'll, I'll bring a bull. We'll offer them as sacrifices. And here's the deal. We'll both build altars. We'll both cut up our animals the way you're supposed to for a sacrifice. And then here's the deal. Only God can light the fire. So he says to the, to the prophets of Baal, you go first. And so they start to dance and sing and chant, and then they get desperate, and they start to cut themselves. And Elijah's heard from God that God's going to show up that day. So he, he starts to mock them. He literally says, well, maybe your, your God's gone to the bathroom. We'll have to wait a while he gets back. That's in the Bible. And so it goes on like that, and it says that they, the prophets of Baal, they called for fire from their God from early morning until noon. At noon, Elijah kind of steps in and says, no, it's my turn. And he gets dramatic about it because he knows he's heard from God. So he gets big basins of water and pours them over the sacrifice just in case it wasn't already interesting. And then he just said, okay, God, it's your turn. The Bible says that not only was the sacrifice on the altar burned up, but the very stones that the altar was made of, it, it burnt up the stones. And then Elijah has the Spirit of God move upon him. He gets his sword. He kills all 450 of the prophets of Baal. And then he says to Ahab, if you uh, want to get down this mountain without getting stuck, you better leave now because it's going to rain. And sure enough, it started to rain. And he picked up his, you know, they wore these robes, and you have to gird up your loins. It's called pick up the robe so you don't trip on it when you're going to run. And uh, and when uh, Ahab gets down at the foot of the hill, he says to, to Jezebel, this, here's what happened. All your prophets got killed, and Elijah won the thing. And she said, if he isn't dead tomorrow like these prophets, he might, she never said what she's going to do, but she wanted them dead. And this great prophet who had just had the whole pressure of doing all this in front of the whole nation of Israel and then had... The, was involved not only in the fire coming down, but in the annihilation of the enemy, you would think he would be pounding his chest. But he runs down, and when, uh, when Jezebel says, you know, I'm going to have you killed, all of a sudden, the, the, the courage that let him do all of that just drains out of him, and he's exhausted. And he just turns, and he starts to run. And he just runs into the wilderness. It says he sat down under a broom tree, and he was so exhausted, he just fell asleep. So much so that God sent an angel twice to like cook breakfast and feed him because he, and then he kept running some more. <sighs> and he, he would say to God, when God would send help, he'd say, just kill me. Just let me be gone. Let me join my fathers who have gone ahead of me because he's so d downcast. I don't know about you, have you ever been that tired that you say things that when you would, you would never thought, you'd never believe, you'd never do. Anybody understand what we're talking about? You're just so discouraged because you're so exhausted. Well, that's what happened to Elijah and his priest. So that, that is being discouraged as it is. But there's no doubt about it that when the, when the Bible uses the word fear, it usually is coupled with, um, with courage. It's it's usually uh, saying to us, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. And usually it's courage versus fear that we see in the Bible. So that's the way the Bible uses it the most. And I think that's really something. And so after the prophet of Baal, the people of Jericho see the Israelites coming. So we're going to jump back now from Elijah, and we're going to go back hundreds of years into when the children of Israel are just coming into the promised land. And one of the first things that they do is they send out two spies. And um, these two spies, they, they go across the, the way. And God is, one of the ways he provided, there was a lady named Rahab. And Rahab, who was a prostitute, uh, sees what's going on. You know what she saw? She saw what they all saw. And that was that there were probably two million children of Israel. 
and they get to the Jordan River, you can just see all of the people of Jericho are inside the wall and hiding. And, and now uh, they think, well, it's a good thing we got the Jordan River between us and all those Israelites. And just about that time, God parts the Jordan River just like he had the Red Sea. And all these people come across and they go to Gilgal. Gilgal was the bottom land that, before the, the hill that Jericho was built on. And so they watch this, all, the whole thousands, millions, thousands of Israelites come and, and start to set up camp there. And once she watched that water part, she said, my, we're in trouble. And so it, it, it's, it went like this. And then she sees these spies coming and she hides them. She keeps them from the officials from her own town. She hides them, covers them up with straw on the roof above her apartment and, and sit there. And this is what Rahab says when she talks to the spies from Israel. She says, as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. And there was no spirit left in any man because of your Lord, your God. He is the God of heavens above and of the earth below. Do you know she's going to convert and become an Israelite? And she's going to be an ancestor of David who becomes the king, which makes her an ancestor of the Messiah who's going to come later. So did you know that courage can melt? I love that phrase, that one minute you can be full of courage, and then when you see something different, it just melts. And I wonder if you've had times when you get yourself all pumped up, and then something goes wrong, and, and it just melts. So uh, people who are courageous can also become full of fear. But the word, the word that is often pre presented as opposite of of courage is fear. Fear not is used in scripture over 200 times. And all through the Bible, it's fear not, take courage. Fear not, take courage. It's like fear is something that's on us. We got to put it down. And then it always says, take courage. I love that. It's like courage is a little box sitting on your kitchen table and you can just pick it up and put it in your pocket and you have courage. Take courage, it says. Like you can reach out and grab it and take it. And that's what we're supposed to do. Look at Deuteronomy 31.6. It says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. We said this last week, but it's worth repeating. Yes, there's fear and there's courage, but then there's always the bonus. And the bonus is, it says, it'll say almost inevitably, it will say, God is with you. Or God is speaking in the first person and saying, I am with you. And think what it changes when we have God and when we don't have God. How many of you know without God, we're dead meat? How many of you know with God, the enemy's dead meat? Now, that's the way it is, and that's what you need to get a hold of, and that's where we are. I love this verse, too, in Isaiah 41.10. It says, fear not, that's our sermon today, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. And I'm going to strengthen you, and I'm going to help you, and I'm going to uphold you with my righteous right hand. Israel, when they get to Jericho, they find out that there's, no, that there's fear in the camp. But then the sad part of the story is, it's one thing for there to be fear in the camp of Jericho. But you know, there was fear that snuck into the camp of Israel as well, where there shouldn't be fear. Because Israel finds fear in, in Jericho, but fear also comes into the camp of Is, the Israelites. And so look at Isaiah 13. Um, verses 32 and 33. So they brought the people of Israel a bad report. Now, what's, let me back, give you the background for this. So this is sometime later when there were just two spies that went out. Moses is still alive. Now Moses is, is going to be gone, and General Joshua is going to be in charge. And so he moves up from being the assistant to Moses to being the guy in charge. And so God's, Moses sends out... 12 spies, one from each of the 12 tribes. And they go out and they check out all the land. And, and when they come back, the verse vote is 10 to 2. And the 10 say that they can't win. And that's where it says, so the, the, these 10 spies brought the people of Israel a bad report in the land. And they were, that, they had, that they had spied out saying, the land though through which we have gone to spy out it's a land that devours its inhabitants. 
the ground is supposed to eat you. And all of the people that we saw in it were of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, those are the sons of Anak, that's giants in, the old, in Genesis, come from the Nephilim, and we seem them to, seem them to themselves. In our eyes, we looked like grasshoppers, and they thought we looked like grasshoppers too. I just think that's amazing that these guys, military guys who are sent out on a spy, come back and said, we're really scared because we, we weren't any bigger than a grasshopper compared to these great big guys. And so when they spread that, here's the principle about fear. Spear, fear is contagious, and, and, and courage is contagious is uh, contagious as well. But in this case, the, the 10 spies bring this word and all the people are scared to death. They, they went out to do this, the spying, they come back and they scare the people to death and the people rebel. And they tell, they say, let's kill Moses and we'll, we'll go back, find another leader to take us back to slavery in Egypt. And they, they, spread, they spread that horrible thing. But the two guys said, we can do this. And that's Joshua and Caleb. And they said, listen, you're looking at how big the enemy is. You need to start looking at how big your God is. That's what you got to do. And it's all about where you look. Because there always is big problems, but there's always a bigger God. Amen? And that's where we are with this. And so, so they, they, they decide to, to go in against the enemy. And you know what happens is fear always causes loss. Fear always causes loss. And in this size, there's loss on both sides because both sides have become afraid. And because the Jericho was afraid, uh, they lost the battle. I don't know if you heard, but the wall fell down. And then Israel, the, you know what they lost? They lost a generation of blessing. Because once they said, we're not going to do this, once they said to God, we're not going even though you told us to go, once they said, we don't care what you say, Moses, we're not doing that. We're not going to listen to the two spies. We're going to listen to the ten. You know what God said? About face. And he marched them back into the wilderness. And he said, as long as anyone's alive in that generation, anybody that was over 20 when they left the promised land, Anybody over 20, we're going to wait in the wilderness until you're gone, and it'll be the next generation that will take the, take the land. And so it's a, it's a terrible thing because he's really, he's not, God didn't kill anybody. He just said, we're waiting until you die. And every member of that generation except for Caleb and Joshua and, and, and Moses died in the wilderness. And then finally, God was able to use the next generation to win the war. So I just want to tell you that the reason we need to address fear is that so many people uh, become afraid. You know, I'll tell you one thing about fear. It's often based on misinformation. Usually, when we have fear, it, it kind of squelches the way we see truth. And, all, you know, how many fishermen are here? Here's what fear has to do with fishermen. You know, you catch a fish and it's about this big, but when you come home, you got to tell your wife that you caught a monster. So it gets bigger. And then the guys at work here, and by the time you get done, you wonder how they ever got that fish through the door, you know? You know what I'm talking about, how it keeps growing? Well, fear's like that. You can have something that you're afraid of, and, and the longer you think about it, the more afraid you are, and the bigger the problem becomes, and often it's based on misinformation. Uh, remember last week, we looked at this uh, out of Mark 6. We look at the passage where the disciples, remember, they take the boat, and they're starting to cross the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus has stayed behind to pray, and they get out in the middle of the thing, and it was like it was on here a couple days last week. The wind is blowing, the waves are flaying, the water is getting deeper. Everything is just really shook up, and in the middle of all that, they look up, and there's this silhouetted guy out there walking on the water, and their conclusion was, it's a ghost. But I want to tell you, the guy walking on the water wasn't a problem. He was the solution. And when he gets there, it isn't bad, and he's no ghost. This is Jesus coming to their boat to get in with them and to save them. And sometimes what looks like the worst can end up the best. And sometimes we get misinformation. It wasn't a, it wasn't a ghost. It was Jesus. I remember hearing a sermon by the great southern preacher, Adrian Rogers, 
And he tells a story about his church was going through a big building program. And one day, he, um, one day he, he'd worked late, and the construction crew had left, and the church staff had left. And he was the only one left in the building. But he decided he wanted to see. He hadn't seen how the progress was becoming that week at work. There wasn't electricity in there yet, but the looms were all laid out and so forth. He wanted to see how it looked. So when he went in to look around, it was still daylight. But he got really occupied looking at everything, and pretty soon he's in there, and it's kind of dark. And he goes to one more room he wanted to check on before he left, and he gets into that room, and just as he's gone across the floor in that room, he sees something move. And he thought, somebody's stalking me. And Adrian Rogers went over and kind of hugged her down in the corner and waiting for this thing to leave. And he sat there for over an hour. And then he noticed that it only moved when he moved. <laughs> and Adrian Rogers spent an hour hiding from his own shadow. And I think sometimes we do that, that we think it's going to be so bad. And it isn't that it isn't a real problem, and it isn't that it isn't something you should take seriously. It just isn't as bad when God's in it as you thought it was going to be. And so... He, he, uh, I just love that story. So, um, okay, now I'm, I, I, messed, I messed up my notes. You've got to give me a minute. Okay. You know, many uh, recovery programs look at fear this way. False events appearing real. And that's how we need to look at fear sometimes, that the things we get afraid of usually... Uh, that they're based on something that's not real, and it makes us think that something's real that isn't. So I want to tell you a story about Ulysses S. S. Ulysses S. Grant, who became the general of the Union Army. But when he was just a young soldier, maybe 18, 19 years old, he was put in charge of a little unit that was to do exploration in East Texas. And so he's out on this journey, and it's the... the the ground was so hard to travel through. There, there was, uh, you know, these briar bushes and 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 all, uh, all kinds of all kinds of problems. And uh, so Grant goes out to explore it, and he runs, and it takes them longer because of the conditions. And pretty soon, they're almost out of food. One of the soldiers is ill. One of the horses has died, and they're still 70 miles from Corpus Christi. And so Grant decided that he couldn't get the men in the condition they were back to Corpus Christi through the tough rain, of the tough areas that they had to go through. The hard travel through thorns and snakes and scrub bush and wolves. There were wolves all the time. So he takes his friend in and they start back to camp. And every night the worst thing is the wolves. Because remember, if one of their horses even gets eaten by the wolves, they're probably not going to make it back to camp, and they're probably going to die if, if the wolves attack the horses instead of them. And so a lot of sleepless nights as they're trying to, to get back, and, and they start to talking about these, these wolves that they hear, and they go back and forth, and, and Grant will say to his traveling mate, say, how many wolves do you think there are in this pack? Oh, I don't know, maybe 10. How many do you think? I don't know. It sounds like more than 10 to me. It sounds like 20. Like there's 20 wolves out there in a big pack, and they're going to come at any time, and we better be awake. And they're, they're talking about this. It's, they become obsessed about it every day. And then one day, there was a clearing, which was really rare in the, in the terrain they were in, but there was a clearing uh, on top of a hill, and they went up, and they, they looked out, and on a cliff hanging out from the other side, there are the wolves. Do you know how many there were? two. In all of this commotion over two wolves, and those two wolves, when they saw the humans, left and never came back. And Grant went home, and he wrote these words in his journal. He said, there's always more before they are counted. I think that's incredible. And that applies not just to wolves in Grant's life. That applies to problems in your life. It always seems like more until you really sit down and count them. And I think that's such a profound statement. So listen, learn from that. What you're going through right now, it seems hopeless. It seems hard. It seems like you just can't do it. 
But when God comes and works and enables and empowers you, you, you can do it. And so Grant learned that lesson watching the wolves. There are always more before they're counted. Years go by, and Grant is now Lieutenant Colonel Grant in the Union Army, and he's ordered to move against Colonel Thomas Harris of the Confederate Army. And Grant forgot his lesson from the two wolves that he had written about, and he was afraid. He, he said he was so afraid, he felt like literally his heart lived in his throat. And he said, I do not have the moral courage to attack this Harris and his troops. But he made himself climb a hill. And there was a 25-mile area that, that someone had cleared. He thought the, the, the Confederate had, but someone had cleared this big area, and it was up on the top of a hill, and he said he knew that as the leader, he had to lead his men up that hill into battle, but he thought it was absolutely meant sudden death because the hill is all cleared out, and he thinks Harris will have his men stationed all around that clearing, and the minute we set step foot into the clearing, we're going to be dead ducks. So he makes his horse go, and he makes himself go, and he gets up, and when he hits the crest of the hill and looks out to where the enemy is going to be, guess what he saw? There's nobody home. You see, Harris became more afraid than even Grant was, and he took his troops and fled, and he left. And Grant would, say, would write in his journal and say, never again would he live in trepidation, that was his word, to confront the enemy. He always figured that they were more afraid than he was. And he becomes the, the general of the Union Army. And he always thinks when they would come in and tell you how many troops the Confederacy has, he says, oh, they always think there's more before it's counted. And when they get into battle and they would say, can we really press in general against them? He would say, oh, they're probably more scared, scared than we are. And that's the way he managed his army from that time on. And he learned those two great lessons. And so I would like to add to his lessons this word from God's word. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Is there a devil? You bet there is. Is there evil in this world? My goodness, is there evil in this world. Are there wicked people? Yes, we live in a fallen world, and there are difficulties, and there are problems, and I'm not saying there isn't, but I'm saying that fear has never conquered a problem. And I want to say to you that you can be someone who can live above fear, confront the enemy, because probably, <laughs> probably it's not as bad as you think, and you have God in you. That's what I want you to get a hold of. Greater is he that is in you. If you've made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you remember what he said the night before he was, when he was arrested to die for us on the cross the next day. He said, I'm not going to leave you like orphans. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to dwell in you. And so is it just you and the devil? Then you're going to lose. But if it's you filled with the Spirit of God, the devil's going to lose. Somebody say Amen. That's where we have to live. We have to understand that if we're with God, that he's with us and we can win the battle. So I think that's a tremendous lesson. So I just declared last week in the middle of the sermon, I thought of it and declared this a fear-free zone. This church is not going to move in fear anymore. We're going to stand in faith. So how do we live a fear-free life? If you're battling with fears, how do we live that life? have a few suggestions. First of all, be honest about your fear. If you have fear, don't deny it. Understand you have fear. And then start to say, where did I get this fear? What happened earlier in my life that opened me up to this fear? What is it about this thing that just, it's not even logical, but f truth is, but it scares me to death. And I think God will show you. Ask him to show you how to have victory over that fear. Maybe there was an experience in the past. You had a really bad experience. And so you think every time you're in that kind of circumstance, it's going to be that way again. But God will show you victory over it. But you've got to look your fear in the eye and be honest with yourself and then determine that you'll defeat that fear. And then after you've dealt with that, search your heart. Psalm 139.3 and force says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. God doesn't hang around sin very much. 
And when we have known sin in our life and we're not willing to do with it, God can kind of dis. I'm not saying he leaves you, but he distances himself from the fear. And pretty soon, the power of God is lost in your fear. That's not what God designed you for. He designed you to live in fellowship with him and to live in victory. And so if you're willing to search your heart and confess the things that are not of God, then God is closer to you. The, I want to tell you that the greatest, the greatest conquering thing of fear is the closer God gets to you. The closer God is in your life the less fear that's in your life. And so claim God's promises. You'll notice on the back of the little sheet that we made for, uh, the, for notes, on the back of it, I put some powerful verses, verses that I think we need to hear uh, if we're gonna win the victory and walk in, walk, walk in victory. So let me read you these verses. Listen, let me tell you about these verses. These verses, this is God's word. God's word is powerful. Do you know that? God's word is powerful. And here's what I'd like you to do. Now, this is generational. If you're in my generation, I want you to get some three by five cards and write these verses on the cards. And if you're younger than me, I know what you're gonna do. You're gonna tap them into your phone, right? But either way, get them somewhere. For a long time, I would have a couple of these verses, especially Psalm 27, one, which is kind of like a life verse for me. I would have it on a, on a three by five card in the visor, of the windshield. And every time we stopped at a red light, I would read it. And you can't believe the power that God puts into that word when you're reading it before him. And never worry about reading too long. The car behind you will let you know when it's time to move. <laughs> so, you can, so you can put all of your attention right on, right on the first. Let's, let's look at these verses. I'll tell you, these verses can be life-giving if you're battling with fear. It's, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or dread. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Deuteronomy 31, 6. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? I've been in some circumstances, not as great as many of yours, but I've been in some circumstances where this verse kept me walking in faith. I would just think of how big God is, and I would think, so devil, what do you got bigger than God? The devil doesn't have anything bigger than God. And when the Lord is your light and your salvation, you don't have to be afraid. And then, the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Nothing if God's in it. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin that, of the wicked that comes. For the Lord your God will be your confidence. I love this one because this one talks about making me confident in the battle. I'm not, only in, I'm not afraid because I have confidence that God is with me and he will keep your foot from being caught. Walk close to God. He says, I'll be with you. And trust God. We've got to ask people. We've got to get to a point where we really believe with all our heart that God is good. Because there are always going to be things in everybody's life, there's going to be a time when something's going to happen that doesn't seem good to you. And you're going to have to say, God, I don't understand this and it really hurts, but I choose to trust you. And when we trust the Lord with all our heart and lean not to our own understanding, and when we, in all the ways we acknowledge him, he will direct our paths. So trust is a huge thing here. And then fear God, not people. So many people are so busy trying to get the approval of man that we lose the approval of God. Don't be a man pleaser. Be a God pleaser. Learn to shrug off peer pressure. <laughs> we think peer pressure is just something kids have. No, no, no. Peer pressure, peer, peer pressure is something that a lot of grown-ups have as well. And we just gotta be freed from that to do the will of God regardless of what people think. The fear of man lays a snare, it says in Proverbs. But whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. <laughs> do you know this picture? I want you to look at this picture. This is a man named August Landmauser, and it's 1936. And this is all the employees of a shipyard, and Landmauser is a part of that, sh of that um, shipyard. And right down here, if we had an expanded picture, would be a picture of Adolf Hitler standing on a stage. And all of these people are doing the high L. 
that, that Hitler demanded that you would salute him like this every time. And everybody that worked in the shipyard is saluting Hitler except for August. You see, just two or three months before that event, August was smitten. <laughs> he met a young lady named Irma Ecker. Irma Ecker was Jewish and fully registered as a Jew. And her and August we fell in love. They tried to get married, but by then the Nazis weren't giving marriage license to Jews. But they had a family. They had two kids. But they would both die eventually in concentration, different concentration camps. But on this day, August Landsmeiser said, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you do. I love my girl, and I'm not going to salute you as you state your purpose is her annihilation. And he wouldn't do that. And every once in a while, I get that picture out, pulled up on my computer, and I ask God, God, please let me love Jesus as much as August loved uh, Irma. Let me love you so much that whatever people do won't matter, that I want to do what God wants me to do. I pray you'll pray that prayer with me. Listen, fear never wins. When you walk in fear, it never, never leads to victory. It always leads to defeat. And so you need to take these verses and learn the truth that is below them and deal with your fear. Because I think days are coming when we're going to have to stand. And the people that are going to stand on the days we have to stand will be the people who have prepared their hearts to stand by trusting God with all their heart. Let's not give fear any license to work in your heart or in our church. Let's be a people who, as Paul said to the church at Ephesus, having done all things, stand. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to live in fear because we have your Holy Spirit in us and we have a God who says, I will be with you. Help us, Lord, to live in the victory with courage that you can give when, when things seem bad. And help us never, Lord, to think that the world is greater than you or that man is greater than you. Help us to put all our hope and all our trust in you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for hearing me. God bless you.